Greetings guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome to this episode of Thought in the After Dark. My name's Ren, and today we're talking about Oleander. Oleandrin and things associated with it. Now, just a, a content warning for uh, this episode. We're going to be talking about the worldwide pandemic situation, uh, GOP politics, and general human idiocy. So, there's about halfway that's just about Oleander itself and what certain plant compounds do. There will be another kind of warning right before it gets to mentions of pandemic things. Just so you know. First off, what is Oleander? To quote a spruce, which is a, a blog, honestly, but to quote the spruce, Oleander, or Miriam Oleander, is a fast-growing evergreen shrub that's hardy and fairly low maintenance. In fact, because of its hardiness, the plant is considered invasive in certain parts of the American Southwest and around the Gulf Coast. It produces fragrant, showy clusters of flowers from around May to October, coming in several color varieties. It grows at about one to two feet per year, usually capping at about uh, four to eight feet, even though some cultivars can get up to 20 feet tall. It's well known that all parts of the oleander are toxic when consumed and can be a skin irritation if in direct contact with the skin even when it's dried or burned. Sometimes especially when it's burned. As, like in the case with poison oak and poison ivy, the oils and general compounds in the plant are volatile and can cause some reverse reactions if encountered, which we'll get to a bit later, especially if you're not in proper protective gear. Overall, the oleander is a largely hardy plant. It can survive with relatively little damage to the leaves, up to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and is a rather fire-resistant plant. Even though when burned, there can be issues for those present, with, again, without protective gear. Uh, also, because it's a relatively fire-resistant plant, it's sometimes planted as a protective measure, so kind of as a botanical firebreak, almost. So, why is it so notorious? Because regardless of where you are, You've probably heard some mention of it, even just in passing. So, there's reports of groups of children, families, uh, entire regiments dying or being otherwise severely negatively impacted, especially after consuming foodstuffs roasted on oleander branches. Now, most are likely familiar with the story of a troop of scouts or a family or something of that nature, who, while camping, fashioned skewers from debarked oleander branches. Now, while caution is needed, 
According to research and analysis, it's highly likely that these reports are more a case of urban legend and cautionary tales rolled into one than any historically accurate, shall we say, reporting. And building off that, stories seem to have circulated in the 1950s and the 1960s in the U.S. and the 1970s in Australia. So, where did they come from? Apparently, there's reports from the 1800s that seem to hold the origins of these accounts, though um, they should be approached with caution as it's unknown how reliable the accounts are, though they do appear to be the origin stories of, of the negative aspects of eating the plant, I guess. So, first we've got a report from John Lindley's The Vegetable Kingdom. Now, this one was published in 1853, but it's referencing a previous work that's, that was published in 1844. So, quote, In 1809, when the French troops were lying before Madrid, some of the soldiers went a marauding, everyone bringing back such provisions as could be found. One soldier formed the unfortunate idea of cutting the branches of the oleander for spits and skewers for the meat when roasting. This tree, it may be observed, is very common in Spain, where it attains considerable dimensions. The wood having been stripped of its bark and brought in contact with the meat was productive of most direful consequences. For of twelve soldiers who ate the roast, seven died, and the other five were dangerously ill. That's followed by George Nicholson's The Illustrated Dictionary of Gardening, where under the Nurium entry in the, the 1866 edition of his book, it says, quote, The leaves are fatal to animals, horses, etc., the flowers have caused death to those who carelessly picked and ate them, and it is on record that the branches, divested of their bark and used as skewers, have poisoned the meat roasted on them, and killed seven of twelve people who partook of it, and thus uh, the beginnings of that narrative. So that, the, the 1866 retelling is a direct callback to what is described from 1809. Now, how accurate is that? All in all, it seems that the stories we know today are, at the very least, conglomerates of past accounts, if not a bit or a lot embellished. Everyone loves a good story. It is known that the plant itself is toxic. However, as noted in the Snopes article, because it's enough of a thing that Snopes did an article about it, entitled Oleander Poisoning, will quote, Oleander leaves and branches are deemed extremely dangerous, with the poison known to affect the heart, produce severe digestive upset, and to have caused death, the size and relative health of the person ingesting the plant have a great deal to do with the severity of the poisoning. The relatively small body size places children especially at risk, making oleander a plant one may not want in one's garden if children are part of the household or live nearby. That applies to animals as well. So, we like science here. We appreciate experiments and experimental archaeology and ethnobotany. As such, I was quite happy to find that there was a 2005 toxicological 
that that's not a word. Toxicological study done to see how much of the plant's toxic compounds actually transferred to hot dogs set to be roasted on them. So, for this experiment, they used Hebrew National hot dogs and the team skewered them on both fresh and dry branches. The hot dogs were then frozen until analysis of the oleandrin content by liquid chromatography and mass spectroscopy could be conducted. Because the oleandrin is the toxic element that is being tested for. So more on that in a bit. And it's frozen because they wanted to preserve the samples at whatever the rate was at the point that someone would have eaten it. So, the results on this. The hot dogs cooked on dried branches contained 14.3 plus or minus 8.8 .8 parts per billion oleandrin, while hot dogs cooked on freshly cut branches contained 7.0 plus or minus 2.1 parts per billion oleandrin. So, interestingly, the oleandrin concentration is actually higher in the dried branches. So, the most contaminated hot dog contained oleandrin, but even allowing for other unmeasured cardiac glycosides, uh, this oleandrin content is orders of magnitude lower than that expected to cause human toxicity if the hot dogs were consumed. In addition, several mechanical difficulties with both the freshly cut and dried oleander branches make their practical use of skewers to cook food unlikely. So, what does that mean? Translation is essentially that well, there would be some impact on the human consuming the hot dogs, likely a rather negative impact, and most likely a digestive reaction and nausea and things of that nature. It's unlikely that that alone would cause death, unless the person has some kind of underlying health concerns. Also, in the process of conducting the experiment, the branches were difficult enough to acquire, prepare, and use for the intended purpose that the situation is unlikely to have readily arisen in the first place, or at least with the purported frequency. Conclusion. Hot dogs cooked on Nerium oleander branch skewers contain a negligible amount of oleandrin. Poisoning by consuming hot dogs or other food items cooked on oleander branches is probably an urban myth. There's likely some element of truth to it, but the retelling is likely rather embellished. All right, so as was just mentioned, oleandrin is the main toxic compound that we're talking about in oleander. Now, what's oleandrin? Oleandrin is a toxic cardiac glycoside in oleander. So, nerium oleander that was classified by Linnaeus. So, it's associated with toxicity of oleander sap, the entirety of the plant, which is very toxic. It impacts the body similar to digitoxin, which is derived from the leaves of the digitalis or foxglove plant, which we'll get into in a later episode.
Uh, it can cause nausea, drowsiness, and confusion. Unlike digitoxin, though, that is sometimes used to treat heart conditions, there's no evidence, really, as to oleandrin's efficacy, but it has been used in traditional medicine as a therapeutic treatment for cardiac insufficiency, and occasionally, according to reports, for uh, certain cancer treatments as well. Oleantrin is often lethal, though concentration is variable, uh, but it causes both gastrointestinal and cardiac effects. And oleander's lethality has been observed in multiple species. So, what is the evidence that we're working with here? There's no evidence that oleandrin works as medical treatment, least of all for COVID-19. Spreading the patently false narrative that it is a safe and viable option is highly negligent. Companies and individuals promoting it as a cure are quite literally gambling with people's lives by spreading this misinformation. And while I'm glad the FDA refused to authorize production, the idea that it was put forward is alarming. So, let's go through a bit of a botany breakdown on the plant and its makeup, and then we'll get back into that. So, the compounds contained in the plant's makeup are highly toxic to almost all animals. Most avoid the plant's green leaves due to their bitterness, but the toxins remain even when they're dried or composting. Make sure any animals you have stay well away from these leaves, as goats and others with similar eating habits can easily be poisoned, because they eat literally everything. According to the San Francisco Gate, quote, Be careful if you ever need to burn oleander. Its smoke is also toxic and can cause intoxication. When the plant is cut and burned, it releases poisons that can affect any living creature breathing the fumes. Instead of burning cut branches and trunks, remove them carefully after donning protective clothing and gloves. Place debris in plastic garbage bags and dispose of it properly. For safety's sake, do not add it to your compost pile. So, as a final point of warning, click away now if discussions of pandemic-related health concerns, GOP politics, and general criminal idiocy are going to negatively impact you. I appreciate your presence here, but take care of yourselves. Now, we've talked about what oleandrin is. Now, what is it used for? Wheel. Articles have been put out by both Phoenix Biotechnology and Avila Herbals, attempting to cite that with homeopathic techniques, the highly toxic nature inherent to oleander is successfully diluted to a point that it is no longer toxic, but instead beneficial. I have a lot of issues with the homeopathic community's insistence that natural is safe, and this seems to fall into the same category. On top of which, for a lot of homeopathy, there's a very small percentage that's added of the plant to something. And it's on the premise that a small amount is, is fine, which neither here nor there, really. So, Phoenix Biotech put out an article in March of 2021 citing that they had developed an oleander extract that was, quote, safe and effective. They have also claimed the company has been producing oleander-related research for 20 years. 
So A, in order to have any reliable amount of the oleandrin levels being used, it reaches potentially unsafe levels. If it works for you for a heart condition or to treat another serious medical condition that's been agreed upon between you and your medical practitioner, that's great. You do you. However, just because it's worked in some instances does not mean that it's safe. And even if it's safe in a contained clinical environment, the company is not selling oleander extract to healthcare practitioners to give to their patients. They're selling it directly to the general public who are scared and trying to figure out anything possible that they and their families can do to be safer. Extract is a concentrated format that at best does essentially nothing with respect to COVID-19 and at worst likely makes the whole situation worse. Also, just a side note, they keep saying how many people are buying their special new botanical drug PBI-05204, because that's the name that they've decided to give it, which the entire website is dedicated to, but it's a science page that's trying to sell you a product, but the site itself is not secure if you Google it. Just thought that was interesting. Also, the company was started by and currently has as its chairman and CEO someone whose only qualifications, if they can be called that, is that he's someone who is, quote, an entrepreneur and a poker player. No disrespect to entrepreneurs and poker players. Some of you are great. However, quote, Mr. Crandall Addington serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Phoenix Biotechnology, Inc. Mr. Addington serves as the President of Enverum, Inc. He has, over the course of 40 years' experience, founded and or operated successful enterprises ranging from chemical manufacturing to oil and gas exploration, development, and production. So, not medical things. No shade to you if you want to branch out, but that's not what this looks like, and the whole operation seems rather shady. So, now, Avila. Avila Herbals is the other company involved. They seem to mostly focus on cannabis, and specifically hemp and CBD products, which is cool. Incidentally, the hemp business launched in 2019. If that was it, we'd only be visiting them in a future episode talking about cannabis. However, there's an entire section of their site dedicated to the promotion and sale of oleander 4x which is their oleander extract according to the documentation they provide it purportedly provides quote temporary relief of flu symptoms such as muscle or body aches headache chills and fever cough and congestion unlike phoenix the site appears to be secure is clean and organized. There are appealing graphics, and it looks like the potential purchasing process would be rather straightforward. Interestingly, the Oleander site is completely separate from the rest of Avila. That's not necessarily a red flag right out of the gate. My site has title links to other pages too, but Unless you're paying attention to the URL, the two sites have been designed to be virtually indistinguishable. The site is easily navigable, but it navigates you to a sales and about page that claims, quote, Oleander 4X is an all-natural homeopathic drug, which is a unique botanical extract from the leaves of the oleander plant, Miriam Oleander. And yes, 
Oleander 4X means that it's four times concentrated. Quote, extracts of nerium oleander have been studied for decades. Well, I mean, if Phoenix has been looking at it for 20 years, then technically it's decades. Quote, Oleander 4X is a whole leaf extract, which has been shown to be safe. The leaves are one of the more volatile parts, though, so, you know, probably not on that one. Uh, Oleander 4X is 100% vegan. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. And does not contain high fructose corn syrup, preservatives, artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners. Also, doesn't mean anything. Good on them for, you know, not adding things to the already toxic compounds, but still doesn't mean anything. Quote, extracts of nerium oleander have been used safely with minimal side effects in thousands of people in the United States. Um, okay, so, on that one, right, there's no statistics given, nor demographic information. If all the things are so above board, why would that be avoided, you know? Also, it could have easily been that group of people mentioned a bit earlier who have had some success with oleander-based therapy for heart conditions and the like. Another one. Quote, Oleander 4X is an all-natural homeopathic drug that can be easily taken sublingually, so under the tongue. I mean, to be honest, most homeopathic remedies are sublingual. Not surprising that that was a thing that they decided to bring out. Honestly, there's a lot of medicines, there's a lot of tinctures, that sort of thing, that are meant to be taken under the tongue because that's one of the easiest and most direct absorption routes. So, this site, right? It's easily navigable. It's filled, as we've just discussed. So, in summary, it's an, an, a site that's easy to navigate with potentially rather harmful information providing a direct link between people who are scared and trying to do things to protect themselves and these products. Which, incidentally, Avila seems to call the products either a tincture or an extract interchangeably, which extracts are also called fluid extracts or liquid extracts and are herbal formulations that are similar in form to tinctures but differ primarily in concentration. So usually liquid extracts are more concentrated than tinctures. So just something to be aware of on that one. All right, now, just to touch on the pricing for this, right? One of these bottles is one fluid ounce, and it's priced at $89.99, usually, at least, but it's on sale for $49.99. This is also the only product available on the My Oleander side of the site. In order to get back to Avila, that is where they've stuck the CBD and hemp related things, you have to completely re-enter the web address. Even if you click home, it just goes back to the main page of My Oleander. Also, while they don't have hemp products on the Oleander side, they have oleander extract on the hemp side under the homeopathy tab. And at the time of recording, well, the oleander side of the site has it on sale for 50 instead of 90. On the Avila side, it's full price for the same thing. 
Now, that could just be because they've not connected it properly for some reason, or something else altogether. I don't know. Interesting on that one. So, for all the issues that I have with the site, it does state repeatedly that people should consult the doctors before taking it, which is good, and then proceeds to suggest that it might be okay to use on children under 12 and pregnant women, you know, with doctor consultation. So, we've gone through the two major production players. Now, let's get into the politics side of this. So, in addition to dealing with a global pandemic last year, we also had a good many social and political issues come to a head. So, in what might seem like a bit of a tangential turn, let's talk about Ben Carson and Mike Lindell for a bit here. Now, what's their involvement in Oleandrin and COVID-19. Mike Lindell of MyPillow, or the MyPillow guy, and Ben Carson, who was Trump's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, both promoted Oleandrin as a potential treatment for COVID-19 in July which was just three months after uh, Trump suggested injecting bleach for disinfection as a treatment of COVID, which is a whole thing. Well, I tried getting FDA approval on August 14, 2020. The FDA rejected the application of oleandrin as a dietary supplement by Phoenix Biotechnology, Inc., which was the company manufacturing the product. To quote a Palm Beach Post article from November 24, 2020, quote, Manufacturers of a controversial oleander extract, touted by U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban, and Urban Development, Ben Carson, for treating his own COVID-19 symptoms, said sales have skyrocketed thanks to Carson and others who recognize the benefits of the homeopathic remedy. Health experts, however, warn about the use of unproven methods to address the deadly virus in the, at the center of an almost year-long global pandemic. We just launched this product at the end of October, and sales are up over 65,000%, said Richard Abiso a doctor of biochemistry who two years ago co-founded the Virginia-based manufacturing company Avila Herbals with his wife Teresa Abizo, a doctor of microbiology. Abizo, whose company is private and does not release financial statements, said he was joking about the 65,000%, but still, he said, response to the product has been phenomenal. Well, Abiso's staff of 35 keeps busy handling the influx of orders, some experts are crying foul, saying that oleander extract has been proven neither safe nor effective for any medicinal use, let alone to treat and cure COVID-19. Indeed, Carson, who said he had become, quote, desperately ill from COVID, admitted that the treatment he received, similar to what Trump got, saved his life, not the oleander extract. Which, really, all of that. Uh, not only false information, but potentially deadly, uh, especially considering the demographic that would tend to actually listen to him. You know? Mike Lindell, who has been connected to multiple shady business dealings over the years, was trying to get Trump and essentially anyone else who would listen to take and authorize oleandrin as a COVID cure last year, particularly when Melania tested positive. In fact, quote, Lindell, uh, a Trump backer who owns a stake in a company promoting oleandrin as a coronavirus cure, was seconding a tweet from conservative author David J. Harris Jr., urging Trump to try it. Now, 
Not only was he trying to promote it, but he has a financial stake in the company. The company being Phoenix Biotech. And I'm not going to go into the financial issues connected to Lindell, but there will be links in the description of the video and the um, audio recording to video essays by a creator called Illuminati, who has done a full deep dive on the subject. So suffice to say, there's been several bankruptcies, shady dealings, and generally suspect business practices. So in an article from The Guardian that was published on August 25th, 2020, quote, Well, Lindell has pitched Phoenix's plant extraction as a coronavirus cure on TV and to the president's coronavirus task force, the company also quietly received $5 million in funding from an undisclosed investor, patented its extract for use in COVID-19, and promoted an early study in monkey cells as proof of efficacy, an assertion one of the study's own authors denies. Now, I realize that the article itself is several months old, but the information still appears to be accurate. Set of the process for getting a drug to market, the article states, Pharmaceutical companies looking for FDA approval typically take drugs through a long pipeline of testing, including in preclinical trials, in non-human primates, and then in a series of clinical trials testing for safety and dosing, leading up to a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial for efficacy. If Phoenix sought approval for its product, the preprint, so the non-peer-reviewed article that it published, would represent a concept for potential study at the very beginning of this pipeline. The median cost bringing a drug to market is $985 million, according to a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Most new drugs fail. Phoenix has conducted two clinical trials for safety of oleandrin and cancer treatment, but both are small. Phoenix proposed providing oleandrin in what appears to be a liquid, according to its website. Uh, and although the company claims to have been conducting research for 25 years, the earliest records seem to be from 2002, and the company was incorporated in 2003. Phoenix then got its extraction process patented in 2005. So, so before we end... I wanted to read an excerpt from the esteemed medical ethnobotanist, Dr. Cassandra Quave's article on the subject from August 18th, 2020. It was cross-posted in both her own blog, The Conversation, and PBS NewsHour. Quote, Oleandrin is the chemical that causes the plant's lethal toxicity. It is known by scientists as a cardiac glycoside, a class of organic compounds with a common feature. They exhibit powerful effects on heart tissue, often with deadly consequences. A preprint article, that is, an article not peer-reviewed by other scientists, is now online. It reports how, in a test tube, oleandrin reduces production of the virus responsible for COVID-19. But this does not take into account the well-known cardiac toxicity of the chemical when consumed by an animal or human. Particularly worrisome is the idea that consumers may misinterpret any publicity surrounding oleander and try to self-medicate with this highly poisonous plant. I'm also concerned the dietary supplements industry may try to take advantage of the public's fear of COVID-19 by developing supplements containing oleandrin. 
There are many other examples of natural plant extracts that are harmful, but oleander is particularly dangerous because ingesting any part of the plant can lead to serious illness and possibly death. What's more, there is no published scientific evidence on the safety of consuming oleandrin or its plant source, Miriam oleander. It is critical that the Food and Drug Administration and its commissioner, Dr. Stephen Hahn, make certain the public is protected from this poison. So, in conclusion, in several ways, things are better now than they were last year when the pandemic began, at least in some areas. There are vaccines, though not everyone has access to them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. We still have a long way to go before herd immunity is achieved, and much of the way we interact, both in person and in digital spaces, will likely retain changes long into the future. Meanwhile, there are still people touting quote-unquote cures, like oleandrin, that at best do nothing, and at worst can cause serious harm. There are entire communities who are fully capable of participating in personal safety measures, and who are abjectly refusing to wear masks in public spaces and get the vaccines. Sometimes any vaccines. In a recent report from NPR, about one in four Americans are planning to refuse the COVID vaccine. According to scientific analysis, we need 70 to 80 percent for herd immunity, and even some who have gotten their first shot are refusing the second. About 25 percent of the population are children who are still unable to be vaccinated, meaning it's very much an all-hands-on-deck situation. Everyone who's able needs to be vaccinated. And there are many who are looking at what's recently happened in India as a further impetus for why we must get as many people vaccinated as possible. There have been hundreds of thousands of new cases each day after large gatherings because there weren't enough vaccines for people. Nothing against India. The government downplayed the impact of the pandemic and most of the vaccines that were largely produced in India were sent elsewhere. And here, there are plenty, and yet there's a shortage of people who want to get them. So wear a mask, get the vaccines, and use some common sense and decency when interacting with your fellow humans. That's all for today. Hope you have a good one. Stay safe. This is Rin, signing off.